The Gates of Jerusalem, by Russell Elliott, The Breaking of Bread. 3. With those who met in Ongier Street, Dublin, the breaking of bread was the rallying point. Having been drawn to the Lord, and to one another, it became at once the occasion for showing forth his death, the basis of all their blessings, of remembering according to his own desire him who had thus loved them, and also the expression of their oneness in him. They never dreamed probably that this simple feast would become the pivot of an ecclesiastical system, and a means of discipline the effect of which would ultimately destroy the very purpose they had in view. Yet such has been the case. Many years ago someone wrote, Truly it is grievous to see such instances as have occurred of the greatest excesses committed by the rash, the forward, and the inexperienced, in the way of invasion of the peace of gatherings, and the table of the Lord, that sweet memorial of love, love strong as death, turned almost everywhere by brethren into the rod of their administration. This surely could never have been but for the ecclesiastical tendency already noticed, and certain misconceptions in regard to fellowship, and what the breaking of bread involves. There are some who seem to think that in breaking bread we somehow identify ourselves with everything with which those who break bread with us are connected. So that breaking bread is made almost, if not quite, the same thing as putting our hands upon people. Not only so, but anything done by any single member commits everybody else. So that it was actually said of a brother who went to hear an evangelist not reckoned as, in fellowship, that he had taken the whole meeting with him. That is, he had committed everybody else by doing what he, as an individual, with a conscience of his own, felt perfectly free to do. Surely no scriptures can be quoted in support of such extravagant notions. Yet such views are held to greater or less extent, and are accountable for very much of the friction and disturbance that occur. If we could divest the breaking of bread of all that has been tacked onto it we should get rid of a great many sources of trouble. It must surely be obvious that in breaking bread we are, as to one aspect of it, expressing our fellowship simply as Christians. In fact, that it is Christian fellowship. We did not make it and we cannot alter it. It was there before ever we were, and no new grounds of fellowship can be laid. It is expressed in the words, the cup of blessing which we bless is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread, one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Our fellowship, as set forth here, is not on the ground of our all doing the same thing, or having the same opinions when we are apart as individuals, it is on the ground of the death of Christ. That death has removed all distinctions after the flesh in order that we may be one. It has also given us a common share in the blessings of Christianity. This is the fellowship, and we must not bring in matters of individual responsibility. Ample room for liberty of conscience as to our own individual walk, even to going to a feast with unbelievers, if so disposed, or eating meat sacrificed to idols, is insisted on in the very same chapter in which the truth of the Lord's table is presented. Consideration for others, however, is to have due place with us. Let no man seek his own but every man another's wealth. All this helps to make the points insisted on clear that breaking bread does not commit me to everything that another may think right. It is the expression of Christian fellowship, not with all that Christians may do. Otherwise there would be no room for the exercise of individual conscience, and each would be ruling everybody else. It may be a great relief to some to learn that breaking bread does not commit them to everything that is done by those they break bread with. The proof of this, from Scripture, is to be found in such passages as Matthew chapter 18 verse 17, and 2 Thessalonians 3 verses 14 and 15. Here we have in the first instance the case of one who had so behaved toward a fellow believer, and remained so impervious to all appeal, that he has to be considered by the party sinned against as a heathen man and a publican. But we are not told that this affects the man's church relationship. The church is to be informed, and intervene in the way of reconciliation, but beyond that it is not to go. And here surely we can see infinite wisdom in limiting such matters to the individuals primarily concerned. The assembly was established for other purposes than settling private quarrels. It was to be a testimony for God in the world, and if the whole communion of that assembly were to be affected publicly by the differences amongst individuals that testimony would soon have been brought into disrepute. Therefore breaking bread with an individual who is treated by one member as a heathen man and a publican did not associate anybody with his acts. The same applies to the disorderly persons referred to in Thessalonians. The breaking of bread is not so much as once raised. 
if that individual had been put outside the church, as some suppose, there surely would have been no need to say specially, let him be unto thee. The contrary thought must however be in the minds of many, or why, when any difference arises amongst us, do we allow it to interfere with the breaking of bread? Has the Lord no claim to be remembered? Have saints because they cannot agree ceased to be members of his body? Has the broad ground of Christian fellowship ceased to exist because certain Christians have ceased to see eye to eye? The fellowship of the Lord's table, 1 Corinthians 10, is certainly not based upon identity of judgment, or like-mindedness, nor is the one body referred to there a mutual agreement association. If it had been so then breaking of bread had ceased long before at Corinth. But did it? They were split into sects, and calling themselves by different names, Paul has to write to them about their contentions, and beseech them to be of the same mind and the same judgment, but he does not rest the breaking of bread upon their being so, or tell them to discontinue because they were not. Nothing can surely be more clear, if scripture is to be our guide, than that breaking of bread expresses in the broadest possible way our fellowship as Christians. Moreover, there is only one Christian fellowship. It has been in existence over 18 centuries. It goes on from age to age as successive generations of believers pass off the scene. No one can form another. Some seem as if they thought they could. They would like to gather into one company just those, and only those, who are in perfect agreement with them, and share all their predilections and preferences. They may do it, but they have left the ground of the Church of God, and their fellowship has ceased to be true Christian fellowship. It is their own. There is a great danger in little communities of those who view truth from a certain standpoint being drawn together and forming a sort of inner circle which becomes of all importance to them. This is damaging to all, but most to those who participate in it. It contracts the affections and the outlook, and instead of the truth, it becomes only a question of our view of it. No meeting, nor any number of believers can make terms of communion for the rest. The terms are already laid down, and cannot be revised or altered without departure from Christian ground. It is not how narrow I can be, but how broad. Him that is weak in the faith receive ye but not to judge his doubtful thoughts. If only we would leave what is doubtful alone, judging nothing before the time until the Lord come, how well it would be for all. The objection will be made that this opens the door to all kinds of evil. If, someone will say, in breaking bread I am not committed to what others do, and say, and think, then an individual might participate who had committed some flagrant sin, or held some pernicious doctrine. This does not follow, however. In the matter of actual sin the case is altogether different. Known and recognized evil strikes at the very root of Christianity itself. It is destructive therefore of the very fellowship expressed in the breaking of bread, and if allowed the fellowship is annulled. It is no longer the table of the Lord then, but the table of demons. We cannot have fellowship with both. And as there is nothing between, there ought not to be very great difficulty in determining who ought to be admitted and who refused. And as already pointed out, two leading cases are recorded in scripture for our guidance, the one a case of moral wickedness, the other a case of error in belief which sapped the very foundations of the faith. One other point needs to be discussed before leaving this subject, viz., the injunctions given in 2 Timothy 2 verses 19 to 26. This is a most important passage. Let us see what it really says and really means. In trying to understand it we need to observe what it does not say, as well as pay strict attention to what it does say. Clearly the Apostle is preparing Timothy for the presence of evil in the very house of God. Just as God's house at Jerusalem, which should have been a house of prayer, became a den of thieves and a house of merchandise, used for man's gain instead of God's glory, so this present house would, as a vessel of testimony, become equally corrupt. Will the reader mark well that no new house is hinted at, no fresh beginning, and no clearing of the house itself? If these three points are grasped to commence with, the true bearing of the passage will be more easily understood. The next thing to be noticed is how intensely individual and moral everything is. It is, if a man purge himself, not purge the house, or purge the people, but himself. He is not told to leave the house. What he has to purge himself from is evident. It has a moral character. In verse 18 Paul speaks of those who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some so that there were false teachers inside actually overthrowing the faith of others inside. This is the kind of iniquity that it was incumbent on all owning the Lord to depart from. 
but it does not say to another house, or another ecclesiastical system, on the contrary, it goes on to describe the mixed character of the great professing body, some vessels to honor, and some to dishonor, and that a man is to see, not that these vessels are cast out, but that he, himself, is not identified with them, or contaminated by them. Then again, to show the intensely moral bearing of the whole, the Apostle adds, flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. It is a company marked by moral traits, not ecclesiastical rules and regulations. Not a company, necessarily, which can be recognized by outward separation, this company must be drawn together not by what is outward, but by what is inward. Not by edicts, or decrees, or judgments, but by moral and spiritual affinity. All else is useless if the pure heart is wanting. But if the pure heart is there, the heart that sees God and therefore maintains an inward separation from what is not according to Him, and that judges what is really evil just because it does see Him, and in order that it may see Him more and more, such a heart will inevitably find its own company with hearts that correspond. This will be fellowship indeed. All else is but as the chaff to the wheat. Without holiness shall no man see the Lord. It is only as each judges the evil in himself, all hatred, arrogance, pride and impurity, that fellowship is possible. And if any man would like to know how pure his heart is let him test himself by what follows in the chapter we are considering. The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. Gentleness, meekness, patience. These are preeminently the characteristics of the new man, and in the midst of a corrupt profession these and such like qualities are alone of any account with God. Yet it is not so much a company we are to look for, or be occupied with, as to be intent ourselves on following righteousness, faith, etc., with all who have a like pursuit. The real question. The point arrived at in the preceding paragraph brings us face to face with the real question. What is it God looks for in his people? What does he require? If much time has been occupied in diagnosing the disease, and pointing out the evil results of ecclesiasticism, it has surely not been unnecessary in view of all the sorrow and unrest caused thereby. Surely, at least, some lessons have been learned, and no one can desire to perpetuate a state of things so fraught with mischief. But we would now turn to the more positive aspects. What then is that good thing which should be sought? What is the supreme good? Or in other words, what does God most of all require of me? The answer lies on the surface of those divine communications God has given us, as well as deep down in the very heart of them. Do we not at every turn find that God requires that his people should be like himself? That his nature should be formed in them, and that they should bear his character? That they should seek to possess the qualities he values most? Consequently such injunctions as the following meet us everywhere both in the Old and New Testaments, He has showed thee, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. We are told to follow holiness, to ever follow that which is good, follow after love. In one word, the supreme good is godliness, which simply means godlikeness. It is this correspondence to himself God requires, and he will accept no substitute. He demanded this from his people of old, he demands it still. For I know him, said Jehovah of Abraham, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord, to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. And why is that deferred? Why, today, are his descendants scattered and forsaken? Just because they failed at this very point. They were not like Abraham in their faith or their works. If the prophets, the greater and the minor, are studied, it will be found that their ministry was always to this end. It was to bring the people morally into conformity with God. For want of this the time came when even their sacrifices and feasts were simply an abomination. However correctly they might seek to carry out the temple worship God would not accept it. These are the terrible words from the lips of Isaiah, your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. Then he tells them what Jehovah requires, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Again, is not this the fast which I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke, etc., etc. Isaiah chapter 1 and 58. The same appeal forms the burden of all the messages of the prophets. 
when David is addressing God with respect to the building of the temple, and asking God's acceptance of all the store he had prepared, even though he is offering untold wealth, yet his conscience tells him that is not enough, there must be something else behind or it will all be in vain, and he seems to break off abruptly, and says, I know also, my God, that thou triest the heart, and hast pleasure in uprightness, 1 Chronicles 29 verse 17. Yes, God judges everything by the state of heart. There must be moral fitness. This is very conspicuous in the Psalms. The King God will set upon his holy hill of Zion, as mentioned in Psalm chapter 2, has his character described in Psalm chapter 1. The first Psalm precedes the second in moral, as well as numerical order. In Psalm chapter 15 the man that shall abide in God's tabernacle and dwell in his holy hill is he that walks uprightly, and works righteousness, and speaks the truth in his heart. And if Psalm chapter 15 gives us a delineation of the righteous man, the next Psalm gives us an equally faithful portraiture of the godly man. And these two characteristics have invariably marked God's chosen men. They are specially mentioned of Simeon, who was privileged to take the child Jesus up in his arms, and of Cornelius, the first Gentile to be publicly admitted into the kingdom. Nor must it be thought that this principle applied only under law. When we come to the New Testament, and the dispensation of grace, it is if anything more strongly emphasized. If God's command to Israel was, Be ye holy, for I am holy, if holiness to the Lord, was to be on the forefront of Aaron's mitre, we find that our Lord in praying to the Father about a new company, brought into even closer relationship, addresses him as Holy Father, and Righteous Father. And we are told, the new man is after God created in righteousness and holiness of truth, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 24. This may indeed be said to be the apex to which we are conducted in every epistle, and thus the point to which God would lead his people is clearly made manifest. If in Romans we are first of all told how a man becomes righteous before God, apart from works, yet the works by which a man becomes practically righteous are equally insisted on at the close. Who can forget the chapter on love in the first epistle to the Corinthians, and yet how often it seems forgotten, and, the more excellent way, consequently not so much frequented as it might be. In the second epistle it is the life of Jesus that is to be manifested, and, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. In Galatians the Apostle insists that, in Jesus Christ neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision, but faith, which works by love. Bringing under our observation, too, the blessed fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, etc., and showing that the really spiritual is he who can restore an erring brother in the spirit of meekness. In all this indicating the true character of that new creation, in Christ Jesus which alone avails. In Ephesians we learn that God has chosen us to this very end that we should be holy and without blame before him, such of our place and portion with all the privileges of his house, and then flowing from this what a marvelous and rich unfolding of all that is in keeping with it. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, to walk worthy of our vocation, with all lowliness and meekness, with longsuffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. While the truth as it is in Jesus is to mark us, let all bitterness, and wrath, and anger, and clamor, and evil speaking, be put away from you, with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you, concluding with be ye therefore imitators of God as dear children. In Philippians all this seems to reach its highest development. For me to live is Christ, says the Apostle while he prays as well as exhorts that they may be filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, and shine as lights in the world holding forth the word of life. Without going further into the other epistles surely enough has been said in answer to the question raised. The above summary shows conclusively what God's supreme desire for his people is, and how we ought to walk and to please him. It is just here that Israel failed, and where the church has failed. Is it not where every movement fails? But God never lowers his standard. If Israel broke down, yet the word to the remnant is, that he would grant unto us, that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him, all the days of our life. And to Nathanael, one surely typical of Israel in the future, Christ says, Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Yes, God not only never lowers his standard, but he is ever seeking to bring his people back to it, and in the end he will do so.
at last with Israel God will achieve his purpose, for, a highway shall be there, and it shall be called the way of holiness, the unclean shall not pass over it, but the redeemed shall walk there. It is the same today. If the church fails, if it joins with the world, if it becomes polluted, the word at the end is the same as at the beginning, these things says he that is holy, he that is true. As if he said, you must answer to me, if you want to please me. In the face of this undeviating testimony of scripture may we not well challenge our own state? Have we ever seriously inquired what it is God wants of us? What does he actually find? Is there not party spirit, and as a consequence more or less coldness and distance towards those we think not of our party? Have we not our views of truth, and preference for those we consider in sympathy with us? Have we not respect of persons preferring one above another, although scripture tells us to do nothing by partiality? And have not these things caused internal dissension until the words of the apostle might be fitly applied to us? Whereas there is among you envying, and strife, and divisions, are ye not carnal, and walk as men? Have not views of truth been made a basis of fellowship until the question has almost to be asked again was Paul crucified for you, or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? Have we not emblazoned upon our walls the motto, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, while within peace is a stranger and unity of fiction? And if this is so, and who can deny it, can it cause surprise that the world, and a worldly church look on with wonder, and some degree of scorn at a company where the necessity for unity and the blessedness of the truth of the one body are insisted on, and yet where the barriers of ecclesiasticism are more firmly rooted than anywhere else? The question will be raised, ought we not to stand for the truth? But how ought we to stand for it? The how has often been considered a very minor point indeed. But the how is almost everything in God's account. If the truth is not maintained in a becoming manner it is not maintained at all. It becomes instead a lying against the truth. If ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. James chapter 3 verse 14. No, the truth is only upheld in one way. We neither hold it nor maintain it except in love. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 15. A mere intellectual apprehension of it is not enough. The truth indeed ought to be maintained, and the assembly is said to be the pillar and stay of it. But how? In the passage in the first epistle to Timothy, from which this statement is taken, it is preceded by the words, How thou oughtest to behave thyself, and followed by, Great is the mystery of godliness. This leaves us in no doubt that the assembly is the pillar and stay of the truth just in so far as the individual members of it are characterized by proper behavior and by godliness. Who for instance would listen to the most eloquent and orthodox setting forth of the truth from the lips of an ungodly man? The truth would fall to the ground for lack of the support of a life agreeable thereto. It is so everywhere and always. If a man stands up and reads some exquisite passage about love and begins to dilate thereon, his words fall upon deaf ears if it is known his life stands in direct contrast therewith. Christ upheld the truth, and he shows us the only way in which we can uphold it. When he said to the Jews, Because I tell you the truth ye believe me not, he could also immediately add, Which of you convinces me of sin? And when challenged as to who he was, he replies, Altogether that which I say unto you. His deeds corresponded with his words. The truth he uttered was but the expression of what he was. I do always those things that please him, the Father, he said. O oh, beloved brethren, how must we regard some of our contentions for the truth, so called, and our consequent divisions in the light of these divine utterances? Is there not convincing proof that the only real way of holding the truth is in love, and the only way of maintaining it in any positive sense is in godliness, holding forth the word of life? And all this is in perfect keeping with the one great abiding testimony before men as delivered to us to maintain by our Lord himself, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one to another. Is it too late to begin again on these lines? Here we shall find peace, joy, strength, blessing, and above all the Lord's approval. The gospel reveals the wonderful fact that God loves. But we are called to express it, and continue it. Beloved, if God so love us, we ought also to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another God dwells in us, and his love is perfected in us. All through the ministry of our Lord, and the writings of his apostles, we are being led on to this point, for it is in this alone fullness of blessing can be found.
how often in that last discourse is recorded in John, and particularly in John chapter 15, where it is a question of our representing him before the world, he presses upon the attention of his disciples his one command, this is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Has not enough been said to show the state God requires, and that in scripture everything is made of what we are. And if anyone should ask, how am I to become all this, answering to God's mind, characterized by godliness, and walking in love, scripture furnishes an answer. It is only by practice. My mother and my brethren, said Christ, are they which hear the word of God and do it. It is not sufficient to know. We may know all the doctrines in the Bible, and all the precepts too, and be very little affected. The Lord did not say, Happy are ye if ye know these things, but, if ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. A Chinese convert wrote to a missionary the other day saying, We are reading the Bible and practicing it. If this is their method it is no wonder a missionary stated that the best pulpit any preacher could have was the doorstep of a Chinese Christian's house. Because, he said, you may be quite sure the one inside is practicing all that you preach about. It is said of Francis of Assisi that he had invited a young monk to preach with him in some town. They had walked to the town, and back again. Father, when shall we begin to preach, said the young man. My son, we have been preaching, we were preaching when we were talking. We have been seen, looked at, and watched, so we have delivered our sermon. Ah, my son, it is no use that we walk anywhere to preach unless we preach as we walk. This principle of practice is laid down in Romans chapter 6 verse 19. Just as a wicked person by practicing iniquity becomes more wicked, iniquity unto iniquity, he says, so a good man if he practices righteousness arrives at holiness. The process is universally recognized. Understanding the theory of music does not in itself constitute a person a brilliant pianist. Only constant and long-continued practice will bring the master touch which no one can mistake. Reading the rules of cricket and understanding precisely how all the different strokes are to be made will not in itself enable a batsman to make a hundred runs in a first-class match. He can only achieve such results by practice. So it is true that just as a man becomes an adept in wickedness by practice, a man likewise becomes adorned with every Christian virtue in the same way. For the simple reason, as someone has said, our acts react upon ourselves. Only in this way can the new man within us be developed. An athlete puts on muscle by exercise. By exercise of another kind a Christian puts on kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, etc. Has there not been a sad lack of teaching of a practical character? And might not this account in some measure for the frequent lapses of a very serious nature calling for the exercise of discipline? There is imminent danger of our sometimes becoming mere doctrinaires. While all this is said, at the same time glad testimony is borne to the fact that there are not wanting conspicuous examples of devotedness and Christlikeness. May the Lord increase in us all that which he most of all delights in. It has been said, as already quoted, the idea creates the organization, the organization destroys the idea. If there is a danger of seeing this realized, does not the all-important inquiry become, what were the ideas which originally created the organization? No one can doubt the existence of the organization. The effects of its presence are visible on every hand. But what about the ideas well nigh lost in the confusion the organization has created? If these can be rescued, if they can be placed once more in the foreground, if they can be enthroned in the hearts and minds of the saints as they used to be, we may still hope, in spite of all that has happened, for days of peace and prosperity. It is only briefly, and very imperfectly, we can indicate some of the ideas the Spirit of God inspired anew in the minds of those responsible for the movement here under discussion. This movement, as an ecclesiastical experiment, someone has said, must fall unregretted, but let us spare no effort to preserve the elements of spiritual strength and beauty that it unquestionably enshrined. This is a word fitly spoken, therefore it will certainly not be waste of time to attempt a summary, however inadequate, of elements so worthy of preservation. 1. Perhaps the outstanding idea, and the one which seized hold of the minds of the early brethren most powerfully, was that the church, though intermixed with, really existed apart from, and independently of, the various ecclesiastical organizations around them. They saw, or came to see, that all that was vital in the church was already organized, because the one body existed consequent upon Christ, the head, being in heaven and the Holy Ghost on earth. 
that behind, as it were, all the outward organization of churches there was a living organization. It had been formed by divine power without human intervention of any kind. Here was a living organism due solely to the fact, that the Holy Spirit indwelt every member, thus uniting each to all, and all to one head. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. And, from whom, Christ, the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part makes increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love, 1 Corinthians 12 and Ephesians chapter 4. 2. The foregoing truth having come to some like a fresh revelation, it soon became evident to such that a human organization had sprung up in Christendom which obscured this membership of an established church, or of some dissenting body, had become the prominent idea. Membership of the one body was largely lost sight of. When the latter idea, however, became somewhat restored to its original place in the thoughts of believers, there seemed to be no reason why the members of this one body should not meet together as such. Thus a second idea took effect, viz. the coming together for the breaking of bread. They all owe their blessing as Christians to one thing, Christ's death. That death had put away all that divided, and formed the basis of a new and divinely given fellowship. They all owned one Lord. They were all members of one body. Did not the breaking of bread connect itself with all this? This do in remembrance of me, was the simple command of their Lord, handed on by the Apostle of the Gentiles. For as often as ye eat this bread, and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death, till he come, was the sequel. For we being many are one bread, one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread, expressed their union and communion. Did any one dream of establishing other grounds of communion, or ecclesiastical tests? We trow not, seeing they had come together on common ground where all had equal rights the question might well have been asked, who will be the first to begin? They found the ground and the fellowship based upon it waiting ready to hand. They could neither add to it nor take from it. 3. A third idea was, that, not only did the presence of the Holy Spirit constitute them one body, but he was also the alone power from which worship and ministry must flow. Were not both the necessary, and natural outcome of life in the power of the Spirit, spoken of in the fourth and seventh chapters of John's Gospel? And did they not read in 1 Corinthians 12 that, no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost? that the same Spirit had bestowed diversities of gifts, and that the manifestation of the Spirit was given to every man to profit with all? And they learned that all this was subject, not to man's control, but to the Lord's. In this way worship became once more the spontaneous gift of hearts touched by the grace of God, and ministry flowed forth. 4. In connection with all this another great idea became prominent, that of being gathered to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. What other name could believers own? Did not Matthew chapter 18 verse 20 furnish a sufficient charter? For where two or three are gathered together in my name there am I in the midst of them. If the name alone were owned, and trusted, was not the presence guaranteed? If so, what more could be wanted? It was not for them to claim any exclusive right to it. But acting in faith upon such a statement prove its power and blessedness. Upon this they ventured and not in vain. 5. Concurrently with these ideas, all found in Scripture, though long obscured, but brought to light by the energy of the Holy Spirit, there was a remarkable revival of the truth as a whole. No exhaustive catalogue is attempted. But to show the range and variety of truths embraced in this spiritual renaissance it is only necessary to mention the recovery of the true idea of the Church as the house of God, not a material structure, but spiritual. The true calling of the church and the proper hope of it for all believers, called in one hope of your calling, the distinction between the Lord's coming for his saints and with them, as well as between the judgment seat of Christ before which believers will appear and the judgments of the 25th of Matthew, and the 20th of Revelation. No clear views on these topics had existed in the church for many a century and along with the recovery of them, and the preaching of a clearer gospel, multitudes of believers came to know what it meant to have peace with God, to be accepted in the Beloved, and to cry by an indwelling spirit, Abba, Father. This led to a clearer apprehension of the priesthood of all believers, and possession of title and privilege to draw nigh to God in the holiest. The foregoing summary, brief and imperfect as it is, will serve at least to indicate the wonderful and blessed character of the testimony committed to those whose minds became filled with these ideas, and whose ways were formed by them.
to bear witness before the church and the world to the existence of the most marvelous organization conceivable, hid from ages and from generations but now made manifest, the body of Christ, to bear witness to a divine fellowship existing amongst the members of that body based upon the death of Christ, and finding its visible expression in the breaking of bread, to have revived the thought also of the presence and power of the Holy Ghost, and as flowing from this of true worship and ministry, and to gather simply in the name of Christ as a witness against all that divides Christendom, was surely a privilege and responsibility of the highest order. Beloved brethren, what has been the result? If anyone looks around him today he may well pause before attempting a reply. Perhaps it might be well if we each and all carried that question into the Lord's presence and in the silence of our chambers, and, perhaps, the grief of our hearts endeavor to answer it to him. For shall we ever render back to him a due return for what we have received? No one can forget, no one surely would forget, that much has been done. To lose sight of the faithful labors of many a servant gone to his rest, or still living, as well as the devoted lives that have borne witness to the power of the truth specified, and to say that these have borne no fruit would be nothing short of blind ingratitude, not to say unpardonable pessimism. But the question is not merely what has been done, but what might have been. While fully grateful for the former, how can we think and how can we speak of the latter? Thirteen meetings in one city with no intercommunion tells a tale the point of which it is impossible to evade. Nor is this confined to one city. This state of things is spread over the land. The ruin of the church has been talked of. Is it nothing to have added to it? Will it be thought unkind to indicate what it is that has led to these deplorable results? For a strange and startling anomaly presents itself. A movement which set out disdaining every sect is in danger of becoming the most sectarian of all, which began by the recognition of all who formed the body of Christ is in imminent peril of refusing every member of that body except a particular clique, the fraction of a fraction. By what process has such an anti-climax been so nearly reached? This is an inquiry we cannot and ought not to evade. If we appear to traverse some ground already trodden, it is only very briefly. 1. Ecclesiasticism, as already indicated, has played a large part in it. The truth of the one body, which in scripture is always connected with such thoughts as having nourishment ministered, being perfectly joined together, having the same care one for another, and that there be no schism in the body, has been made an engine of discipline so that decrees of excision have been carried into effect to the remotest corners of the earth. A few have legislated for the many, and on the ground that the body is one insisted on all accepting the decision as a condition of fellowship. It might be thought that if the truth of the one body taught anything it taught that one member could not act so as to compromise the whole body, but that all ought to act in unison. In the early centuries of the church's history these things were understood better than they are now, for when any difficulty arose likely to affect the whole assembly of the faithful they called a council, and representatives came from all parts. This helped to secure justice, and keep mere party tactics out of the field. But apart from all this can anyone show that discipline is ever in scripture even remotely connected with the thought of the one body? If it is not, and it has been made along with the breaking of bread a means of giving effect to ecclesiastical edicts need we wonder that disruption has been the consequence. 2. Another frequent cause of trouble has been a morbid dread of evil. No one can speak lightly on this subject, or say a word which would make evil appear less so. But yet there is a very real danger in being too timid of it, and the consequences of this state of mind have been at times disastrous. God, our Father, is not standing over us with a whip insisting that we should do hardly anything else than watch and see if evil pops its head above the ground in order to smite it instantaneously, or failing to do so bear the penalty. If the parable of the wheat and the tares does not primarily apply to the church as such, yet it surely contains a lesson for the church. Let both grow. In rooting up evil prematurely how often the good has been rooted up likewise. Just as in the early stages of growth wheat can hardly be distinguished from tares, so if evil is judged before it is right many hardly discern that it is evil. The silver trumpets and their use have an appropriate lesson here. They were not always to be used for sounding an alarm. Sometimes they were used to gather the whole assembly together, and at other times only the princes and heads of thousands. This latter use seems to have been entirely overlooked. If an alarm is needed, by all means sound it, but to do so unnecessarily may produce a panic. 
if we smite about wildly at the supposed presence of an enemy we may smite friend as well as foe, and brother may be at war with brother, when really as to all essentials they are in agreement, and loyally serving under the same banner. A farmer in Canada was returning home from market the other night when he was conscious of being followed by some animal. A few days before he had bought a prize ram for which he had given 100 pounds, winter however had set in earlier than usual that year, and owing to a forest fire, and the rigorous state of the weather, wild animals had been coming into the farmsteads, doing considerable mischief, and the farmer imagined he was being followed by a bear. For an hour he stood between it and his sheep, with a lantern in his hand, while he sent off to the nearest village for some crack shots to come. They came and riddled the supposed bear with bullets, and when they had done so they discovered they had shot the prize ram. Such is the effect of panic. The morbid dread of a bear made the farmer think his own ram was one. This incident is not without its counterpart in the church. Never do we need to keep our heads so cool, or our hearts so warm as when we judge evil. Otherwise instead of killing the wolf we only scatter the sheep. 3. The measures employed to repress evil have often been too severe. Is the only cure for headache decapitation? We are to be valiant for the truth but this does not necessarily involve separation. Paul withstood Peter to the face. But Paul did not excommunicate him, nor try to get others to do it. Paul and Barnabas were driven apart by the heat of their controversy, but the question of the breaking of bread was never so much as raised as far as we know. What we do know is that many years after Paul wrote of Barnabas to a certain company, if he come unto you receive him. And let us be quite sure it is the truth we contend for and not our view of it. If our only aim and desire is to be in a company where everybody thinks exactly as we do, it is but turning the church of God into a club. If it had been remembered that there are other cures for a wounded limb beside amputation, perhaps many would have been walking together today who are now far apart. Let us strive together for the faith of the gospel, Philippians chapter 1 verse 27. But let it be, the faith, not some biased view of it. And let it be, together, not against one another. 4. Making fellowship a matter of caprice has been another cause of the sad breakup. Instead of seeing that fellowship is not a thing I have any right to withhold except with the gravest reasons, it has been declined often on the most trivial ground, and sometimes without any reason being given at all. The fact is it gives some people a little importance and status to say, we are not free to extend you our fellowship. And thus one of the most blessed privileges on earth, fellowship one with another, is turned into a means of sorrow, and reaches sometimes even the point of tyranny. Let it be said again so that there shall be no fear of mistaking it fellowship is bound to be accorded unless definite and weighty reasons can be given for withholding it. Personal feelings and predilections are to have no place whatever. Five, has not another stumbling block been the thought that power and authority vested in the saints at the beginning, when all was in order, can be exercised precisely in the same way when circumstances have altogether changed? After centuries of disorder in the house of God, a disorder which still exists, does anyone suppose it can be completely ignored, and the original order re-established in every particular? Yet this has been attempted, and the failure we mourn over is not a little due to the effort. Had due regard been had to the character of John's writings, as already pointed out it would never have been made. Where there is life in the power of the Spirit it will find a way to manifest itself. Instead of this everything has been systematized and molded to a certain pattern with the consequence that formality and uniformity are more conspicuous than the power and fruitfulness which are alone of vital worth. 6. A misunderstanding and misapplication of the words, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, have tended not a little to paralyze the movement of which we speak. There is one person who never can forget being present at a reading many years ago with well-instructed brethren, when this verse was the sole topic of conversation. He left about as wise as he came, for the simple reason, he believes, that the view of the speakers did not go beyond the organized system of meetings with which all present were connected. Another unity was really in their minds all the time they were discussing the unity of the Spirit. They connected it with something that could be seen and organized instead of with that which existed because of the death of Christ and the presence of the Holy Ghost, and which depends upon a moral state and not upon observance of ordinances, or outward methods. The unity is there. We are to keep it. 
it is maintained in peace. Yet how often that peace has been broken with a view to keep the unity. Surely an unaccountable proceeding to throw away the bond in order to keep that which it binds. As strange as to break up a casket to preserve the jewel it contains. Brethren, have we understood the value of peace and what secures it, walking worthy of our vocation, with all lowliness and meekness with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love? The ideas which first brought Christians together and formed the movement here spoken of are so great, that it is felt no apology is needed for having pointed out what has proved a hindrance to their growth. The resuscitation of these ideas is the need of the hour, and the getting rid of all useless excrescences. Only let us be occupied with these ideas and unity is assured. It is because small differences are magnified and allowed to obliterate all that unites that division and internal dissension have become so rife. Yet the former are a mere vanishing point compared with the latter. Members of one body, the body of Christ, partakers of a fellowship founded upon nothing less than his death, and characterized by what he is, for it is the fellowship of God's Son, indwelt by one Spirit and that Spirit, God, the Holy Ghost, gathered to one name, the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, are not these links great enough? Can we substitute anything in their place, or act as if they were non-existent, without tremendous loss? There is one thing and only one thing that is needed to give as much effect to them today as ever, and that is love. For many a month there has sounded in one person's ears, at times like a solemn knell, the words, If ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. But love heals all, and difficulties become easy of solution in its presence. Without it we are nothing, with it we are, and have, everything. It is greater than all, it is the bond of perfectness, it never fails. The Corinthians had shining gifts, and splendid church organization, notwithstanding Paul says to them, Yet show I unto you a more excellent way. And having done so he beseeches them to follow it. If only we would follow this advice and give ourselves up to love's supreme influence for six months, judging every rising in our hearts contrary to it, what a change would be wrought. This is our only hope, and in urging it upon the reader we close. We have seen how ecclesiasticism has marred the testimony which otherwise might have been borne to the great and distinguishing truths of this dispensation, and well nigh destroyed the enjoyment as well as the expression of that fellowship which has been divinely formed. It has been our effort to show that what God always looks for in his people is a character answering to his own, and that he, consequently, did not require an ecclesiastical movement but a moral one. What a witness such a movement would have been, and was, so far as these conditions were realized. Is not such a movement still possible? Thank God it is, and without starting anything fresh. But it can only be as the ideas that originally took effect take effect again. God has nothing new. He cannot go beyond himself. If he calls us to be imitators of him he has said his last word. That is the only possible testimony in these days, the testimony to what he is, and what he has effected, a testimony which in its simplest element resolves itself back into the one word we have been considering, the word which expresses what God is. Nothing lower will do, and there can be nothing higher. And the soul that will seek this, or the company that will seek it, earnestly, consistently, perseveringly, shall find a fullness of joy, a blessing, and a power that shall leave nothing to be desired. Shall we not seek this, and in doing so shall we not find Christ enough for us? Is he not great enough, great enough still to unite his people? Do we not need to get back to the one commanding truth of Matthew chapter 16 connected by our Lord himself with the very building of his church, and in getting back to that get back to the center of all? Whom say ye that I am? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. It is upon this the church is built, and all who honestly and with all their hearts make this confession, ought to be as near to each other as possible, and not as far away. As each gets back to this in simplicity and faith, shall we not get back to one another? In proportion as we allow other things to separate and divide we are committing the terrible and mischievous mistake of making those things more important than Christ. High up in the Andes, in a lonely spot, stand a monument with the inscription Christus Pacificator. It commemorates the reconciliation of two South American states. Cannot such a monument be erected today among some of the Lord's people at least, and upon which those two powerful words Christus Pacificator shall be truthfully inscribed? Words which the whole church and the world may come and read, and in reading learn again the reality of Christ's coming into the world, and his power still to unite all who own him.
In accordance with this he prayed, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. John chapter 17 verses 20 and 21. Finally, the supreme question of the hour is whether we shall sink down ultimately into mere sectarianism, interested only in those who agree with us, a sectarianism of the worst kind because the narrowest, the most bigoted, and the most enslaved, or whether, casting aside the trammels of a useless and mischievous ecclesiasticism, enlarged and free because owning only what the Spirit has formed by His presence, and Christ is the head of, we shall be known as those whose one bond is Christ, and whose only law is love. One is your master, and all ye are brethren. R.E.